Welcome to this episode of the Revolution and Ideology podcast, continuing our Myth is America series. I'm Nick. I'm Jared. In this episode, we are going to uh, continue our last episode in which Jared told us about uh, Alexander Hamilton and his economic policies. We're going to talk about the Whiskey Rebellion, which was a reaction to uh, some very specific policies that Hamilton put into place. This one actually rings uh, home for me because uh, some of you may not know, but I actually own a distillery. So when we talk about taxes on distilled spirits, uh, I know all about that from firsthand experience. Uh, and so I'll, I'll uh, at the end of the episode, actually put it in terms of what that looks like today, because believe it or not, this tax is uh, still in place today. So I can talk a little about what that looks like in real life. But let's go back to history and talk about when this first gets implemented and what happens. So I'm just going to provide a brief summary. I would highly suggest you go listen to the previous episode uh, where Jared talks about Hamilton and Hamiltonian economics. Uh, but just super briefly, basically, in a long story short, uh, Hamilton's the Secretary of Treasury at this time. This is uh, around 1790s. And they're essentially looking for ways to pay down the uh, federal debt, which they have uh, uh taken the debt of all of the 13 states and assigned uh, it to the uh, federal government. And as Jared talked about, not out of like the goodness of their hearts, but because the federal government is looking for economic control over the uh, each of the individual states, which they achieve uh, handily, I think. So they need some way to pay the debt. Uh, spoiler alert, war costs money. Uh, the government is still, uh, I think, shocked by that every time it seems to happen. I don't know how they haven't figured this out yet. Uh, so they're in debt from the war and they need to pay it back. Uh, so Hamilton uh, unleashes uh, various policies, uh, their, their taxes, that's what they are, to try to start to raise revenue uh, to pay down the national debt at this point. And one of them, Jared goes through uh, numerous ones, but basically the first, uh, one of the ones that he does that has the biggest reaction from the people themselves is the excise tax on distilled spirits. Um, however, Whiskey by far was the most popular distilled spirit at the time, so it becomes known locally basically as just the whiskey tax. It's a tax on whiskey. However, what's key here is it's an excise tax, and an excise tax is a tax on the production of a good, not on its sale or its consumption. So an excise tax is uh, you get taxed at the point of production, which becomes hugely problematic. Um, if you're curious, this specific tax law goes into place uh, in March of 1791, which I always think it's interesting that this is exactly two years uh, to the month after the beginning of the new federal government. So it took them two years to start just essentially taxing the shit out of everyone uh, to try to repay their debt. So this war is fought over unjust taxation and uh, very sh shortly, quickly into uh, the federal government's history, it's just taxing the shit out of everyone again. And if you go back and listen to our episode on Shays Rebellion, uh, we talked about how in Massachusetts at the time, taxes were three to five times higher than under the British government, which is just, I mean, ridiculous to even think about. So I want to, again, reemphasize, as we've mentioned in other episodes, they have made taxes higher than they ever were under England, and yet the vast majority of now Americans are not represented. Because again, women were not given suffrage, slaves were not given rights. Uh, it, it's it's mind blowing. Like the the hypocrisy. Why do you think they're like this? I've asked you this question, I think, three episodes now. How do you say you're fighting for something in 1776 and turn around less than two decades later and do the exact same thing you were fighting against? Yeah, I think that it just reveals their motivations, I think, for the war. I mean, it all depends, right? The like sympathizers would say, well, they just had no choice. They had to pay the debt. So even if they didn't want to, they just had to. I think that's nonsense, but... It, you know, there's so many various reasons. They that, didn't have to. No, there didn't, didn't need to be this overarching, controlling federal entity. None of that was necessary. They were still hashing that out. They made their choices. And their choices were to protect their interests, uh, create massive socioeconomic stratification, even among the quote-unquote franchised population to include white males. That's what they were protecting. This is, and we, I, we'll go back to even Charles Beard on this, this is an economic measure. This is not a political, this isn't creating some like romanticized utopia of democracy. They, in their own words, as we've already discussed in prior episodes, that's not what they wanted. 
George Washington does not end up the wealthiest landowner on the continent after the war for independence because he is like some champion of democracy. Does not happen. Completely. Okay, so why is this tax on whiskey a problem? Well, first off, whiskey is an incredibly popular drink to be consumed at the time. But the second reason is that frequently people were paid in whiskey. So whiskey functioned as a sort of currency. And in fact, that was so popular that the common quote-unquote people viewed this as an income tax, that the their, in, their currency was no longer as valuable because the tax that had to be paid on it. So that's super important. Like Jared talked about in the last episode, this federal currency that's being created, uh, it basically doesn't have any value yet. People are still, whiskey is still out there. Uh, there's various ways that people are paying each other, and whiskey is one of the more common ones. So this new federal tax on whiskey is hugely problematic. Um, another reason is uh, based purely on production of the farmers themselves. Many farmers had their own stills on their farm so that they could distill their excess grain at the end of every season and turn it into whiskey because storing grain over long periods of time become, is incredibly difficult. But if you can take all the grain at the end of every season and anything that you haven't sold off or that you can't put to use, you can ferment that and turn it into whiskey using a, a still that you would have on your property. So this excise tax means now that they're being taxed just basically for storing their grain in the form of whiskey. Just by turning the grain to whiskey, they have to pay a tax on that. And as you might imagine, they obviously hate that. Yeah, this is the 1700s. Things like crops, things go bad. Like, and this is a way to make sure that they're at least preserving some viability moving forward. Whether they use that whiskey as a currency, whether they drink it themselves, does not matter. This is them preserving their livelihood. Exactly. The third reason that this is problematic is that the tax was regressive, which means that it overly targeted small distillers fairly. Uh, in fact, it was about 30% more. So the more a distillery produced, the less tax they were required to pay. This, re this favored the large distilleries that were mostly located along the coast. And uh, this was no secret. The large distilleries recognized this immediately, and they became full supporters of the taxation, which leads us to all kinds of economic and political uh, sort of ramifications here, because the large distilleries know that they're paying a lower tax. So they actually go and support the excise tax because they know it will destroy economically all of their competition coming from the uh, smaller distilleries. Some historians go as far as to argue that Hamilton structured the tax this way specifically to benefit the large distilleries and get them on his side, both politically and economically, uh, which is interesting to think about. I think uh, if you listen to Jared's episode, he discusses the political and economic shrewdness of Hamilton, so I would not put this uh, beyond him by any means. How many taxes did Amazon pay last year? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. None. The law also required that all stills be registered with the federal government. So now if you're the farmer that uh, uses a small still on your property to distill your leftover grains into whiskey at the end of every season, you have to register this device with the federal government purely so that they can come and ensure that they are collecting the taxes uh, on the, the distillation of this whiskey. Now, I can tell you that this law is still in place today. If you start a distillery in the United States, you must not only register with the federal government, you must also have serial numbers on all of your stills, and you must register those as well with the federal government. That still exists to this day. Freedom! Um, the law required that anyone violating the law, that means not paying their taxes, not registering their stills, etc., had to report to courts in the eastern part of the state. This trip took days for farmers in the western part of the state. I'm talking about Pennsylvania here, and that'll be, it'll be important in a second. Um, this took a days, trip took days for farmers in the western part of the state, which they could not afford. They couldn't afford monetarily to make this trip, and they couldn't afford to take days to travel to go up here in court and leave their farm and their livelihoods. If you remember back to our episode on Shay's Rebellion, this was one of their demands that the central court be moved uh, from the east part of the state to the more central part, this is Massachusetts for Shays, so that it would be easier for them to attend court proceedings. That never happened, so people are still pissed about this. So now you might like be charged with not paying your excise tax on your whiskey production, and you'd have to travel all the way to the coast to attend the court proceedings, which you could not do. So, I mean, needless to say, people are pissed about the whiskey tax. Super pissed, so much 
uh, so that they are going to form a resistance. So in mid to late 1791, this resistance begins to form uh, and become organized, and there is a formal convention um, where opposition is drafted with a list of grievances which they sent to both the Pennsylvania Assembly and the United States House of Representatives. Uh, both of these entities were located in Pennsylvania at the time. So that happens in uh, late 1791. There is now a formal resistance. In September 1791, a tax collector was tarred and feathered. Uh, he was serving warrants to uh, the people that were uh, being accused of not paying this tax. So a tax collector gets tarred and feathered. And this wasn't like his uh, effigy getting tarred and feathered, like the dude legit got tarred and feathered. Uh, also, a little bit later in 1791, another man serving warrants for the same thing, uh, tarred and feathered as well. So two people are tarred and feathered here. As a result of the violent attacks, uh, the tax goes uncollected in 1791 and 1792. Just pause for a second. Those, yeah. We know that these are some of the same things that the Sons of Liberty had done, uh, you know, a decade and a half earlier. So the tactics were still the same. And while we mocked the Sons of Liberty for performing such actions, we will mock these protesters too. Did uh, – what are their names? John Neville and Benjamin Well, did they deserve to be tarred and feathered or intimidated this way for merely doing their jobs? Eh, that's debatable, but probably not. Like tarring and feathering is torture. Let's just be blunt. That is torture – that's completely uncalled for. But what I want to stress here is in one case, we've celebrated under the Sons of Liberty in our historical narrative. In the case of the Whiskey Rebellion, it's like, oh, my God, they're out of control because it's no longer British tax collectors. It's American tax collectors. Yeah, Jared's right. I mean, the parallel between this and what the Sons of Liberty were doing, it's like exactly the same. They're fighting against taxation using the exact same means. Um, so like I said, as a result of this going on, this violent resistance, the taxes went uncollected. Um, the tax was modified in May of 1792 and was reduced by one cent. So kind of sort of as an olive branch by the government, they say, okay, we see that you're pissed. We see that you're violently fighting this thing. We'll lower it by one cent, which at the time, I think it was nine cents for the smaller distilleries. So they lowered it by one cent. So going from nine to eight cents, I don't think is going to appease very many people. And like, it's no surprise that it did not. Um, this obviously was unsatisfactory to the opposition. In uh, August of 1792, they held another convention and decided to escalate their tactics. Um, essentially, oh, ooh, we have a correction here. Benjamin Well and Neville were not the ones that were tarred and feathered. Yeah, I was going to leave that till I got there. But oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. I My own notes were, okay, uh, yeah, they were not the ones that were, well, whatever. Nick, get to it. Yeah. I want to make my question. I don't actually know the names of the collectors that were tarred and feathered. I don't have that in my notes, so. Okay. Um, I guess I probably should because they whatever. deserve it. But, I'm yeah. making my own correction. <laughs> um, it's important to note that these people that are resisting learn from the methods of the War for Independence, and so they form committees of correspondence which, if you remember, are basically communication networks that they established to keep in touch with each other. And they took control of the local militias. So they started, uh, I mean, they didn't like seize violent control over the militias. They just started being members of the militia. And as more of them, more of them became members of the militia, then that ideology became dominant in the militia that they were going to fight this tax. In 1793, they burn an effigy of a local tax collector. This is John Neville now. So he didn't get tarred and feathered. His effigy just got uh, burned. So that, I mean, yeah, that's like Andrew Oliver. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, the parallels now we're starting to see them even more and more between the Sons of Liberty tactics and the tactics now. Later in 1793, in November, they break into the home of a tax collector, Benjamin Well, and force him at gunpoint to resign his position. Oh my God, the Sons of Liberty did exactly this thing. Yeah, so we can see the the mirroring of the tactics here. There's a couple of skirmishes between the, uh, I don't even know what to call them, resistance fighters, of, I don't know, and uh, United States troops, one being a standoff and small battle at the home of tax collector John Neville on July 16th, 1794. Uh, one of the leaders of the resistance was uh, Major James McFarlane, who was a veteran of the war. He was killed. The uh, historical accounts say that a ceasefire was called and he stepped out of the trees into the open and he was shot by U.S. troops. So 
Uh, many of the accounts at the time from the rebels obviously say that after the ceasefire, the U.S. troops shot him. Most of the evidence say that it probably didn't go down like that because there was a huge distance between the uh, rebels and the U.S. troops that there's no way they could have even intentionally shot him at that distance, that it literally just had to be bad luck that one of the bullets happened to hit him. Um, I was listening to a, a, a researching this and they were talking about how like, there was no weapon at the time that could have shot that distance accurately, that they literally just had to be just blind luck that he happened to get shot and died at that distance. So uh, probably not that the U.S. troops shot after the uh, ceasefire shot him intentionally. There were just still bullets flying, and he got happened to get caught in the fray. But he does die, and uh, obviously the rebels don't care that it was just an accident. Uh, his death sparks outrage among their ranks, and he's given a hero's funeral on July 18th. 1794. Uh, and basically, this is the classic like martyrdom of a resistance movement. And as a result of his death, the numbers of the people willing to fight against this tax uh, begin to grow significantly uh, once he dies. This brings a federal response, a strong federal response. Um, though Washington in the beginning kind of plays both sides. So he doesn't really uh, make a strong stance publicly one way or the other. He sends public officials to go talk with the rebels uh, in an attempt at reconciliation. Uh, but he basically just does this as a public maneuver because under the table, he's raising an army to go and fight them. So publicly, he's like, okay, you guys go talk to the rebels and let's try to work this out. But like I said, uh, behind closed doors, he's raising an army to go fight. Um, due to the Militia Act of 1792, uh, you legally could not raise a federal m militia until a Supreme Court justice certified that control of a state population was beyond the control of just that state. Mm -hmm. um, so this, be gets, this gets granted on August 14th of 1794. Uh, Supreme Court Justice James Wilson of Pennsylvania uh, declares that the state was uh, in rebellion and that they needed federal troops to uh, come quell the insurrection. So he, they approved the federal militia. Um, calls for militia were put out in New Jersey, Maryland, Virginia, and Pennsylvania. Their goal was to raise almost 13,000 troops, though they couldn't do it. They tried again. and... Again. Yeah, They could not again. raise the amount of troops. Gosh, man. Very few Fighters. men volunteered yeah. to join the militia because they knew that they were being, uh, they were going to be put in service to go and fight the rebels, and so many of them agreed. Couldn't raise it to fight Shay's Rebellion. Couldn't even raise it to fight the British. Yep. Like, they... Gosh, the manufactured narrative about just rampant patriotism, people like literally like just whatever, I don't know, wearing like fun, the American flag around. It's just ridiculous. So they again implemented conscription, which is basically like a draft. And people then draft evasion becomes rampant and riots begin to break out when they're trying to force people to join this militia. In fact, violent and armed draft resistance breaks out in Virginia. But eventually, finally, uh, the troops get gathered. Uh, but this is no, like Jared said, it's not like they were like, hey, we need this militia to go fight these tax rebels. And everyone was like, cool, sign me up. This, the people fought this like tooth and nail uh, at times violently. Because what are they being asked to do? Go yeah. out to the, the same class of people. Yeah, you might be a merchant. That guy might be a farmer, but you're of the same like class. You're being abused by this tax system. You had no interest in being part of this like massive overarching federal entity. You literally thought when you were fighting in that war for independence, you were fighting for the things they were talking about. Freedom from tyranny. Tyrannians. And what you see now is you are now working for new tyrants and you don't want to fight your fellow, again, farmers or your fellow vets or your fellow, again, sailors, whatever it is, you have zero vested interest in this. And that's one of the things that what we'll be talking about in future episodes, because I do want to preview those, is how slowly but surely we do manufacture a separate policing entity to try and, again, fracture the labor class to get the enforcers of the government to see themselves as superior and different than the uh, than the rest of us peasants, so to speak. Yeah, that's so key. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, think about what they're asking these people. Like, we need you to join the militia so that you can go and fight against these guys that don't want to pay the whiskey tax. That no one wants to go do that. Why would you? Who cares? Well, like, people do now. That's the yeah, point. This fracturing. Yeah. Like there are people that join various forces of whatever enforcement that are doing so because of 
their disdain or dislike or disconnectedness with their community or people with different religions or shared values or whatever it is. Or some, yeah. yeah, race would be a huge one. That's like the elephant in the room. And they're more than willing to like implement force to, again, in this, in this case, protect their status, which really protects the state. Yep. Rather than they have much more in common with these people that they are enforcing these uh, laws or taxes upon than the state. But the state just merely uses them as pawns. That's the great irony. God, I can't wait to do some more modern episodes where we really mm-hmm. dig into this. But we'll have to cite this old stuff. Yeah. Then something kind of interesting happens on uh, September 30th, 1794. George Washington himself leaves the Capitol, which was located in Pennsylvania at the time. And he goes out into the field to monitor military activity. This is the only time in U.S. history that an active president has led troops in the field. Clearly, this was just like a display of power of this man going out on horseback, this legend, right, this military legend, and going out into the field to monitor the activity of the militia that's fighting against these rebels. And when I say fighting, by the way, this isn't like a war. There's actually even nothing going on. They're not even fighting. There's nothing going on. But this show of force is is a is a show of force against his own people. This is yep. getting them to submit. This is a submission move. Exactly. Surprisingly, it works, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, in October, so the next month, Washington leaves command of the uh, army to the Virginia governor, General Henry Lee. Uh, I think I mentioned his name. You might remember back to the uh, Shays Rebellion episode. General Lee, who's now the Virginia governor, was the Washington's friend who was keeping him up to date on the developments of Shays' Rebellion. So you can actually go and find there's letters between the two of them. Uh, Lee is going back and forth with Washington basically the whole time throughout Shays and telling him what's going on. And then remember, if you remember from that episode, it, it is the activities of Shays' Rebellion that lead Washington to come out of retirement and attend the Constitutional Convention. And then from there, he gets uh, elected president. So he, like we talked about before in that episode, he was basically done. After the war, he didn't want to do anything else. He was just in Mount Vernon chilling until Shays comes about and Henry, Henry Lee is telling him through letters about all of these developments. And they start to genuinely believe that like their new government is uh, in jeopardy. Um, then nothing happened. Like, literally, that's it. There were no shots fired. Uh, nothing, basically, the federal government doesn't even really do anything. This was just a huge show of force by the government and Washington himself that they had power over the people. And this is so crucial in American history because this show of force by Washington and his cabinet and the militia that they raised establishes the power militarily and violently that the government has to... uh uh, put taxes into place to tax the people. They are enforcing their economic control and their control over the individual lives, consumption habits, production habits over the people. I, we cannot stress this enough. This is right after the damn constitution was the paints or the paint. The ink's not even dry yet. And they are in, immediately taking away people's individual freedoms and liberties. Just think about it from Washington's perspective, right? Hamilton puts these taxes in place. Washington approves them. The people raise up. And so Washington's response is, cool, you think you want to fight my taxation? I'm going to raise an army and I'm going to lead them into the field my damn self. And I'm going to prove to you that we have the power to tax the shit out of you. This is exactly what he does. After being elected by less than 10% of the voting public. I mean, the whole thing, the whole thing. Gosh, the manufactured narrative we have around this era is out of control. Then just to show how much of just a show of power, display of power this was, and he didn't even believe in any of it, uh, Washington promptly uh, pardons all of the rebels. So none of them even do any time or anything. They don't get any debts. They get nothing. Oh, Washington just straight pardons so all of them. So magnanimous of yeah. him. Oh. Mm. It just proves how much of a display of power that this was. It wasn't – no one cared about anything else. Um Yeah, so this just proves the lengths that the new federal government would go to to protect its laws, its legitimacy, and most importantly, its economic control over the people, as Jared just said. Um, So yeah, that's the Whiskey Rebellion. Let's talk about after this time frame. It's in place until 1801 when Thomas Jefferson gets elected and he repeals it. So he says, this is unfair, this is ridiculous. And if you remember from the last episode, he already had huge problems with what Hamilton was doing. So he straight repeals the whiskey tax in 1801. 
and it is repealed until they need money to fund the War of 1812. So they put it into place again. After the War of 1812, it gets repealed again until they need to fund the Civil War, and then they put it into place again. And now they extend it to other beverages, including beer and wine. Uh, yeah, it extends to wine just prior to World War I, and then it go, it's in place uh, still to this day, though it's not really called a whiskey tax. Um, I don't remember what the actual code is called, but it doesn't matter. Um, so they, there still is a federal tax on distilled spirits. Uh, it exists at the state level too, though I'm not sure about every state law. I only know Colorado because that's where my distillery is. Um, so here's a real-world example. The federal excise tax as of right now in 2019 is $2.70 per proof gallon. So it's different based on the uh, percentage of alcohol in the bottle, basically. Uh, just if you care, a proof gallon is one gallon at 50% alcohol or 100 proof. So if you have a whiskey and it was somehow in a gallon, which you can't even sell, but let's say that it was, you had a one gallon uh, of whiskey that was 100 proof or 50% alcohol, you would have to pay the federal government $2.70 on that gallon. Um, I don't have the number of what the state uh, is in here, but the state also, the state of Colorado also has its own excise tax, though interestingly, it's calculated in wine gallons, so it's just purely a gallon. It doesn't matter what the proof is, you pay that straight across the board. So, just so you can get an idea of how this impacts uh, alcohol production, for uh, just one product that my distillery produces, the total cost of our production of producing that thing, so if you know about accounting, this is the COGS, right? The cost of goods sold. Both federal and excise, state excise tax together, the cost of that bottle that you're buying off the liquor store shelf, 56.7% of that is taxes that we have paid to the federal government. 56% of our production costs. Holy shit. Yes. It is ridiculous. By the way, I want to state that prior to two years ago, right now it's $2.70 per proof gallon. Prior to a, a significant law change two years ago, it was $13.50 per proof gallon. So even now it's ridiculous. Two years ago, it was whatever that is, five times as much almost. Ridiculous. Um, yeah, then like I mentioned earlier, uh, every distillery to this day still has to register and be approved by the federal government. And you have to also register all of your distilling equipment so that they can track that as well. Many people, I think, erroneously think that that's linked back to prohibition, but it actually goes back to the original whiskey tax uh, that we just finished talking about. So I don't even know. Completely ridiculous. It is funny, though. One of the things that we talk about in the distillery industry is like, no matter what your political opinion is, whether you're super liberal or super conservative or whatever, if you get a room full of distillers together, every single one of them hates paying that tax to the federal government, hates everything about it especially because it's on production and not consumption. So just how it works in real life, if in my distillery we produce, let's just say, we whatever, a gallon, just for easy like ease of things. We produce a gallon of whiskey. We produce that and it sits on the floor of our distillery. Let's say we put it in bottles and there's a pallet of like bottles sitting on the distillery. The second that it passes the line outside of our warehouse or our distillery, we have to pay taxes on it. So it's not technically at the production point. It's once it leaves the warehouse, we have to immediately send the taxes to the federal government. Even before, we might not have even been paid for the selling of that product yet. We have to pay our taxes. And the federal government requires all distilleries. This has become a little more lenient in the past year. But you, ha you used to have to get a bond that was basically an insurance policy so that if you went out of business before you were able to pay your taxes, the federal government could claim that insurance policy and they would still get paid. Mm. So you get an idea of how taxation of this product is so crucial to the government, even to this day. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, and tied to the other policies we talked about in the prior episode, this is how you, again, basically codify economic stratification yep. and beholdenness to a federal entity. But I think the fact that this story, people know about the whiskey tax and the whiskey rebellion, but... It's not woven into the common narrative of the history of the United States like it should be. The fact that Americans at this point fought violently against this taxation straight from the get-go. Well, and that's one of those things is oftentimes part of our podcast or what I'll do in my U.S. history classes or whatever it, it is. It's to exhume un unknown or subjugated knowledge of the past. 
I don't believe, well, when we did Shays or even when we did Hamilton or when we do it, we're doing whiskey right now. Some of this stuff is, people are aware of it. It's just not, the way it is framed as somehow like little different cute asides to the actual narrative and not actually part of the narrative itself of the structuring in this case of the economy or federal control over the material lives of its constituents who don't have a say so in the government in many cases like here's the thing like that's what we're missing out on is that connectivity so there are going to be equal parts in our our episodes where we focus on things that most people have never learned about US history even the things that we do learn are framed in such a way that they're completely either they're just inconsequential especially the negative pieces like the whiskey rebellion like hamiltonian economics like shay's rebellion they're just they're just asides right ah mm-hmm. just a little hiccup along the way no fundamental into creating a federalist entity absolutely crucial we're experiencing the largest socioeconomic gap in human history not us history in human history Right now, as we record this podcast, and we can at least trace a little piece of it all the way back to this time period. All right. I want to leave us with a little just tidbit of like bar trivia. Do you know who owned the largest distillery in the United States at this time? I'm the history guy. I should know it, but I don't, I don't know it. It was a man by the name of George Washington. So he's the, he's the, he's the wealthiest landowner and he owns the largest distillery? Yep. This freaking guy. Yeah. Well, all right. Before that... I, yeah. Before I yap, let's end this. <laughs> All right, you can catch us online. We're on Twitter at Rev and Ideology. Uh, we have a YouTube channel. Just search Revolution and Ideology. You can subscribe to us there. Uh, to our few Patreon supporters that are starting to trickle in, we appreciate you guys so much, and it helps us uh, do more of this uh, with your hard-earned dollars that you send us to support us every month. If you like what you're doing, you can uh, support us on Patreon. Yeah, I'm Nick. I'm Jared. Later. <laughs>